afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Siomo. I'm the chairman of Ways and Means and the District 9 City Councilor. Today is Tuesday, May 21st. We are here with our good friends from the Boston Planning and Developing Development Agency. Uh, I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing broadcast live and recorded on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I've asked folks in the chamber to silence their cell phones and electronic devices. We will take public testimony at various times throughout the hearing. There are sign-in sheets to my left by the door. I ask that you sign in, state your name, affiliation, residence, and please check the box yes if you wish to testify. There are several ways to testify. You can attend a public hearing like this one and uh, sign up for public testimony. You can come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, between the hours of 2 and 6 p.m. However, we will stay as late as, um, as necessary to hear all that would like to speak on the budget. You can send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means, Boston City Council, fifth floor, Boston City Hall, Boston Mass 02201, or email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, we are here with uh, folks from the Planning and Development Agency as they pertain to dockets 0622 through 0625. Orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriations for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, as well as dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. I'm going to read a couple of letters into the record from colleagues who are unable to make it today. Dear Mr. Chair, due to work-related travel, I regret that I am unable to attend today's hearing of the Committee on Ways and Means on dockets 0622 through 0628, the FY20 budget for the Planning and Development Agency. My staff will be in attendance, and I look forward to reviewing the recording of this hearing. Please read this into the record. Sincerely, Kim Janey, District 6, Boston City Councilor. Dear Chair Siomo, thank you for oversight of the budgetary process. I regret that I am unable to attend the Boston Planning and Development Agency hearing on May 21st, 2019 due to travel. I look forward to reviewing the tape. Uh, regards, Lydia Edwards, District 1, Boston City Councilor. And in order of their arrival, uh, to my far left, Councilor Tim McCarthy, Stepping out for a moment, Councillor Michael Flaherty to my right, to my immediate left, Councillor at Large, Anissa Sabi George. Back again to my far left, Councillors Matt O'Malley and Ed Flynn, and Councillors Andrea Campbell and Frank Baker off to my far right. And with that, uh, I will hand it over to Director Golden. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, uh, Chairman Siomo, Vice Chairman McCarthy, and members of the Council and the Committee. My name is Brian Golden, and I'm the Director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss our work and our budget uh, with you this afternoon. I'm joined today by Devin Quirk to my left, Director of Real Estate, Lauren Shirtlift to my right, the Interim Director of Planning, and Trin Nguyen, Director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, which falls under the BPDA. Also, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, Brian Conley, brand new to the agency. He's the new Director of Finance for the BPDA. Brian is a resident of East Boston. He was, uh, we recruited him as, uh, out of his position as Director of Administration and Finance for the City of Weymouth. Uh, we're making Brian's commute a lot easier from East Boston to downtown <laughs> Boston instead of the South Shore. Uh, but we welcome Brian Conley to the agency and look forward to working with him. Uh, our agency, as you know, is charged with growing 
Boston's tax base, cultivating the city's private jobs market, training the workforce, working with the community to plan the future of neighborhoods, charting the course for sustainable development and resilient building construction, advocating for multimodal transportation, responding to the city's changing population, producing insightful research on our city, and ensuring Boston retains its distinctive historic character. The BPDA works closely with the Department of Neighborhood Development, the DND, on affordable housing through our Inclusionary Development Policy, IDP. We also work with the Assessing Department on Chapter 121A in lieu of tax agreements, as well as the Transportation, Public Works, and Parks Departments on the impacts of development in the city neighborhoods. This past year marked a productive year across the BPDA. We continue our work to create robust economic activity throughout the city of Boston while better engaging and collaborating with the city's neighborhoods and communities. We experienced another very strong year for real estate development, construction, planning, and overall economic activity. We are welcoming both new residents and new employers who see the tremendous benefits of choosing Boston as their home. We're in the midst of the biggest building boom in Boston's history. This has been a recurring theme for the past several years. New development is moving forward and creating local economic, economic development and jobs in every neighborhood in Boston. We approved over 12.1 million square feet of new development in 2018 and nearly 4,400 new residential units, of which 20% are income restricted, helping us make significant progress towards reaching Mayor Walsh's goal of 69,000 new housing units by 2030 to house our growing population. The 2018 approved projects will generate over $37 million in linkage funding for, for affordable housing and job training this year, $31 million for housing and more than $6 million for jobs training. Development is supporting the growth of the city's tax base, allowing for critical funding for city services like our schools, streets, parks, and public safety. For fiscal year 19, the City of Boston is expected to receive $133 million in new property tax revenue, 77 million results from new development being taxed for the first time. Development is also creating thousands of new jobs. Since 2014, projects approved by the BPDA board have created 48,432 construction jobs and 48,622 permanent non-construction jobs. We have put climate resiliency at the forefront of our work. We've updated our zoning code to require new projects to demonstrate resilience to sea level rise and other impacts of climate change. A public process is currently underway, began this month, to create a flood resiliency zoning overlay district, which will give us a tool to protect against risks to life, safety, and property damage and conserve the value of land and buildings. Our economy in Boston is strong, but we know there is more we must do. We will only truly succeed as a city if every single person has a fair shot at the opportunities we are creating through our work. I'm pleased to report we have taken several steps this year to increase our diversity and inclusion efforts. This past fall, 
we rolled out new diversity criteria as a requirement for all responses to requests for proposals for public land. Respondents must now include a diversity and inclusion plan articulating a commitment to meaningful participation by people of color, women, in the businesses they own, in construction, design, development, financing, operations, and ownership. This policy will foster a more inclusive workforce while creating more opportunities for building long-term wealth and economic prosperity for all. It's still early, but the impact of the new policy is promising. We are seeing new partnerships being formed and new outreach happening that simply had not taken place before. In the next few years, the policy will apply to up to 2 million square feet of public land that is likely to be developed. We're exploring ways to strengthen our tools for enforcing this policy and creating new ones. We've worked with the Mayor's Office of Economic Development to launch a disparity study that will provide the data we need to strengthen our equity policies. The results of that study will give us the legal tools we need to enforce this policy, further diversify the BPDA's procurement practices, and provide more opportunities for growing small businesses, getting good jobs, and building wealth. At the same time, we're serious about recruiting a diverse workforce to reflect the neighborhoods that we serve. We're in the process at the BTPDA right now of hiring a talent recruiter who will be specifically charged with implementing a hiring diversity strategy. This past winter, our entire staff participated in a full day off-site implicit bias training discussion. That's being followed up by a smaller group training that will further dialogue around race and ethnicity. These sessions will develop a proposed action plan with the goal of fostering inclusivity and equity-minded perspectives at the BPDA. Concurrently, senior leadership at the organization is participating in diversity workshops that assist in building increased capacity to support staff and future staff recommendations. Within our planning department, we've launched a community engagement team to serve as liaisons between staff and community members. Their role is above and beyond Article 80 proceedings and community planning efforts. These are our eyes, our ears, and our primary means of communicating with community leaders and uh, activists and community members as individuals and groups in our neighborhoods. We've also increased interpretation and translation services at our public meetings, especially for the various neighborhood planning studies underway. Lauren Shirtliff, our interim director of planning, can speak in more detail about this work. And finally, our budget, which we are here today to discuss. I'm happy to report that due to several reforms made over the past few years to improve the way we operate, the BPDA is seeing favorable trends in both revenue and operating expenses. This is further explained in the questionnaire responses you received with our fiscal year 2019 budget summary. This document helps describe in detail our operating budget and expenses. In October, the BPDA took another step towards addressing our infrastructure needs by establishing a capital reserve fund as a mechanism to set aside funding for critical projects outlined in our 10-year capital improvement plan. This will ensure that any positive financial performance we see 
goes directly to supporting our capital needs. Currently, that fund has $18 million in it. Last week, we provided an update to our board of directors and explained that we have identified over $10 million in capital projects that will begin in fiscal year 2020, along with over $9 million of expenses from ongoing projects. We're grateful for the $2.4 million included in the city capital budget for resilience projects in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park and planning projects. Nevertheless, our comprehensive capital needs assessment, which identifies and prioritizes over $200 million in long-term investments in infrastructure projects to support future economic growth in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park, the Charlestown Navy Yard, Long Wharf, the China Trade Building at 2 Boylston Street, and the BPDA's other physical assets is providing the roadmap for the prioritization of projects. We are now working to establish a strategic and sustainable funding plan to support this critical work associated with our property. In closing, we at the BPDA are committed to continuing to evolve into an agency that better serves our community and creates an inclusive Boston with opportunity for all. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Trin Nguyen uh, for a discussion of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development's activities. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Director Golden. Um, thank you, council members who are present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Siomo and Vice Chairman um, Ch uh, Councillor McCarthy. Um, my name is Trin Nguyen, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of the Office of Workforce Development. OWD is an innovative agency within the, the Boston Planning and Development Agency, as you heard, BPDA. We seek to ensure the full participation of all Boston residents in the city's economic vitality and future. OWD funds and oversees programs that promote workforce development through education, job training, apprenticeships, financial coaching, career pathways, and the like. Support from the BPDA allows our office to leverage federal and state dollars and successfully carry out our programs and goals for workforce development. For example, last year we channeled $14 million to over 100 community-based organizations in the city of Boston, serving thousands of residents. Managed and supported the Mass Hire Career Centers in Boston, one in downtown and one in Roxbury, which served 15,500 job seekers and 761 employers. These centers placed workers in jobs that earned an average of $21.61 an hour. We also supported youth programs that served over 1,600 young people during the summer and throughout the school year, including 1,400 placed in jobs and 146 who made educational advancements in post-secondary education. And in our last funding round with the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust, which I also want to acknowledge uh, Councilor Siomo, who was the previous trustee and now the new uh, trustee, Councilor Baker, thank you and welcome on board as a trustee of the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust. Last year, the NJT, which is funded by linkage fees, as you've heard Director Golden had talked about, through developments throughout the city, we trained and educated over 2,300 Boston res residents alone with those linkage fees. This investment positions workers for career pathways and living wage jobs and employers that we brought through the development through the BPDA. For example, we also place graduates of um, these programs into <coughs> Uh, career pathways in growth industries, now earning an average wage of $15.23, with 72% of these participants and workers having benefits and career pathways. Our office, with our funding, also supports the Boston Tax Help Coalition, and the coalition just completed its annual uh, year of free tax preparation for Boston residents, serving ap approximately 13,000 residents and households, and returning two point 
six million taxes back to the community and households, and then there, then it is recycled back into the economic vitality of Boston's neighborhoods. A new component of our Boston's wealth building effort is also launched within our Boston Builds Credit. It's a citywide partnership with the United Way and List Boston within OWD, and we've completed our first year of assisting Boston residents to improve their financial well-being through credit building. For example, highlights of the first year included reaching 1,600 residents for coaching and performing 2,400 financial checkups with credit advising. And the result is that over half of these Boston residents increased their scores by 30 points in obtaining low debt and low interest uh, loans for both their cars, homes, and, and, um, and student education at the same time. Lastly, through the, mayor, the mayor's tuition-free community college, which is also funded by linkage fees, and the neighborhood's jobs trust, we currently enroll over 300 Boston public school graduates in our plan. Students enrolled through the program have an average graduation rate of 70% over three years, and that's above the industry rate nationally and throughout the state. And the majority of the tuition-free community college students are students of color and women and single women throughout the, the neighborhoods of Boston. Mayor Walsh's uh, tuition-free community college, college plan now expanded to include four higher educational institutions, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, Bunker Hill Community College, Mass Bay Community College, and Roxbury Community College. All this is made possible by linkage fees in the Neighborhoods jo Jobs Trust and development around the city of Boston. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about our office, and I'm happy to follow up with any questions you may have. Thank you, Tren. Thanks, Tren. Um, I'm, so I also want to thank the chair and the, and the members of the council for having us here today. I'm Devin Cork, and I'm the director of real estate for the agency. In this role, I'm responsible for the over 11 million square feet of real estate the BPDA owns across Boston. And as the council knows, our major contiguous land holdings are in the Raymond L. Flynn Industrial Park, um, Marine Park in South Boston, and the Charlestown Navy Yard. We also hold many urban renewal properties concentrated in downtown, Charlestown, Roxbury, the South End, Chinatown, and several other neighborhoods. While much of this uh, portfolio is actively leased to long-term land lease holders, we own nearly 200 properties which require our care and maintenance. Our work is to, to redevelop our vacant and underutilized properties, often gets the most attention, but the real estate team is also responsible for the daily operations and long-term capital improvements needed of all of our properties. Under Director Golden's leadership, we've recently completed, completed a 10-year capital needs assessment, which lays out over 170 important projects, that, which amount to over 200 million in capital needs. And to understand the BPDA's budget and, the long -term, and its long-term financial strategy, it's critical to understand the scope of this capital assessment. While the list of projects is too long to go through, I thought it might be helpful to highlight a couple of examples. Uh, in the Charlestown Navy Yard, we have recently com committed to the demolition and environmental remediation of Building 108, which is the dilapidated former power, power plant. This $5 million project will remove a blighted eyesore from the neighborhood and pave the way for future redevelopment in the historic monument area. In the Marine Park, we have major capital uh, needs on both the east and south jetties, where the crumbling seawall is beginning to present a hazard for our property at the end of Fid Kennedy and Dolphin Way. Replacing all the maritime infrastructure in this area will likely exceed 16 million, so we are taking this project in stages over the next several years. In the near term, we are moving forward with the seawall and bulkhead reconstruction on the east jetty, which will cost approximately 2.8 million. At the China Trade Building, we are building off the nearly 16.5 million in capital in improvements we have made in recent years at this important pro property in Chinatown. Um, by moving forward with a $425,000 project to repair the atrium and skylights. Beyond restoring this building to its historic grandeur, this investment will also improve the experience of our tenants, which include Urban College, Chinatown Main Streets, the Boston Public Library Chinatown branch, and many others. And on long work, we are beginning phases of a long, uh, long planning long-term resiliency investments needed to address sea level rise and the deterioration of the sea wall due to wave action from boat traffic in the area. While the needed investments here might likely exceed 10 million, we are working through the downtown municipal harbor plan and all of the area stakeholders to identify cap how capital expenditures in this area can protect both downtown from future flooding while also improving the public realm. 
Well, those are just four examples of a list that goes on, on and on. The good news is that in recent years, our real estate assets have performed well, allowing us to set aside the capital necessary to begin to make some of the, these necessary improvements. And as you heard from Director Golden, we have uh, worked closely with the BPDA finance team to establish a, a strategic funding plan that works in conjunction with our procurement and administrative ob objectives. In addition, we are very grateful to the Walsh administration and to this council for the opportunity to occasionally access City of Boston capital dollars. This year's capital plan includes one critical BPDA project, a $2 million investment uh, to improve the long-term resiliency and streetscape along Northern Avenue in the Marine Park. In closing, I just want to reiterate our commitment to transparency, inclusive, inclusiveness, equity, and fairness in the way we conduct our real estate practice. As the director highlighted, we are prioritizing diversity and inclusion in the development of BPDA property, and we are also investing in strategies to advance diversity in our contracting services. To further that goal, we recently submitted a joint application with the city for the Living Cities, uh, which is a natural, national accelerator program to promote inclusive procurement. This is important work that will help ensure our investments and financial transactions continue to align with the values of our agency and our city. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Lauren Shortliff, who is our interim director of planning. Thank you, Devin, and thank you also to the council members uh, present this afternoon. My name is Lauren Shirtleff, and I am the interim director of planning at the BPDA. The planning division uh, is comprised of five highly collaborative departments, which include urban design, downtown and neighborhood planning, climate change and environmental planning, regulatory planning and zoning, and transportation and infrastructure planning. Our staff is comprised of professional planners, architects, and urban designers. Planning at the BPDA is an iterative process which involves community engagement, expert consultants, and the input of our experienced staff. Resulting plans are comprehensive documents which articulate broad community goals as well as outline physical development opportunities and guidelines. Guided by our citywide master plan, Imagine Boston 2030, a two-year, $4 million effort that was completed in 2017, we have recently embarked on a number of new planning initiatives. We are very much committed to implementing these studies using the Imagine Boston framework with the goal of supporting a vibrant economy, enhancing quality of life for all of our residents, and preparing our city for climate change. This past year, we kicked off Plan Downtown, Plan East Boston, Plan Mattapan, and Plan New Market. Nearing completion, our plan Glover's Corner in Dorchester and plan Dudley Square in Roxbury. These are in addition to the various other planning efforts we are engaged in, such as the Alston Brighton Mobility Study, the Seaport Transit Strategic Study, the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park Master Plan, and the Flood <coughs> Resiliency Zoning Overlay District and Resiliency Design Guidelines process, to name a few. To support these efforts in the past year, as Brian mentioned, we have hired three new community engagement managers and built out a community engagement team, which now totals four. They are helping to engage diverse communities and expand our efforts in reaching new community voices. So far, we are receiving excellent feedback about their work. Moreover, with the purpose of advancing our community engagement activities and reaching the widest possible audience, which frequently includes a population whose first language is not English. We have expanded our investments in er interpretation services for public meetings, as well as translation services for all printed materials, including meeting advertisements. The goal is that these investments will help make more connections with the communities that we serve. With that, the director and my colleagues thank the chairman for his time and look forward to the rest of this afternoon's discussion with you. Thank you uh, for, for your presentation. Let me now recognize Councilor Tim McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Golden and staff, thank you very much for being here as always. If I go down the list, uh, you know, uh, Director Golden, you, you have a really good team. You really do. Thank um, you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, if I go down the list Council, of all the people sorry. who are. Oh, yeah, no, I get promotion. That's all right. <laughs> I'll take it. Vice Chairman. I'll, I'll take Just it. I'm vice for a chairman. job, so if you got anything up there. Um, <laughs> but uh, you really do have a great team. If I if I fail to mention somebody, I'll get in trouble. So that's, a over, that's an umbrella of you've got a good team. But I will mention Lance Campbell just because uh, <laughs> we're, we're, gonna be a, we're gonna be in a, a war zone tonight around 6.30 uh, for another, for another uh, fantastic uh, uh, fun and exciting meeting. Uh, and uh, literally I walked to that meeting, it's across the street and it's the 
it's the worst meeting ever. So uh, <laughs> I'm Lance sure it'll is really, be fine. Uh, Lance has done a great job <laughs> at, at uh, keeping his cool. I have not. I should probably uh, watch Lance, uh, you know, take his advice a little bit better. Um, so, so having said that, I'll, I'll see him tonight, and you'll hear all about it tomorrow. I'm sure you um, will. Thank you. But uh, in, in the budget, you, would, uh, you had talked about um, um, in the budget chart, $62 million in revenue for a budget. And one of the questions that we all ask is what neighborhoods do you feel are lacking behind? And I know that this is kind of a setup question because I want you to talk about High Park and uh, the fam out uh, line and the, and the, uh, the 30,000 foot view of, of what's going on with that light industrial area that you and I have visited. Yep. Um, if you can just give a synopsis of that, um, because I think that what you're trying to do, what this administration is trying to do, and what I agree with you trying to do, um, is important, especially as we go into a meeting tonight regarding exactly this topic. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Councillor McCarthy. At this point, um, what's going on there is, is much more project-based um, and less of a planning lens. Uh, we are you know, reviewing projects within the Imagine Boston framework. Um, in the sense of, you know, an enhanced community, and we look forward to continuing that dialogue. Um, I don't have any specific remarks uh, that specifically sure. talk to that right now, but I can get back to you with some. Okay, that'd be great. And we could talk about the Mattapan uh, plan, though. Mm -hmm. All right, that was my next, that was, that was the next shot, yeah. So do you want just a status update on Just a Mattapan? status update would be great. So right now, <laughs> they've, um, they've been having, um, a lot of uh, light engagement and a couple of workshops. Yeah. They're actually speaking of um, having a, uh, you know, a diverse kind of audience. They're having a Haitian focus meeting this Thursday, yep. which is going to be uh, presented in Haitian Creole primarily with an English interpreter. Um, so that's kind of interesting and exciting. Um, they've also had some uh, inclusionary development program updates out in Mattapan recently. In terms of the actual planning study, um, Right now, we have a request for proposals out for consultants to help us kind of work through what plan Mattapan is going to become. Uh, those responses are due in a matter of weeks, and um, you know, we've had pretty good feedback so far from the develop, uh, proposal or consultant community, and we look forward to engaging with a team, um, hopefully uh, by the July board that would be approved by the BPDA, and we could start work with them. Very good. Now, is, is Imagine Boston coming back out to the neighborhoods at some point? So that's a good question. Um, I like to think of it that all of the planning initiatives take their guidance first and foremost from Imagine Boston. And you know, we start all of our presentations with how and what specifically Imagine Boston called for in those neighborhoods. Um, in terms of the uh, actual document uh, coming back out, that's something we're actually working on, figuring out what the best uh, way to do that would be. Maybe it's you know having somebody on our team that's specifically focused on its implementation, for instance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Brian. And uh, obviously, a pleasure to work with you and your team, uh, particularly uh, Mike Christopher, who's a regular customer down on the city hall side of the building. Uh, Thank as you, well Councilor. as uh, the resource that you have in Heather Campesano and uh, your newest addition, Steve Harvey. Uh, mm -hmm. They know the inner workings of, of the council, so. Pleasure to work with all of them, as well as the rest of your team. You had referenced in your opening, uh, and I caught a piece of it, uh, I think you referenced how many projects or parcels are being taxed for the first time. Can you just rephrase that again? Sure, so if you look at the city's new revenue for, well, FY19 isn't complete yet, but it's about to be complete. It looks like about $133 million in new revenue. Uh, will flow to the city as a result of um, uh, gains in property tax revenue yields. Of that 133, 133, new, uh, 133 million new dollars that are flowing to the city from property taxes, 77 million are flowing from new development. That's, that's something being taxed at its full rate for the first time, a complete project. And <clears throat> so, as you can see, it's significantly more than half of the new revenue that is flowing to the city and property tax dollars is from brand new development. And obviously it's not just one time, it's embedded in the city's property tax base forever. So that really is the gift that keeps on giving. And it's what allows the city and the city council to, to, to budget incrementally, uh, slightly more money every year. That's how you're able to grow the budget, to provide the high quality 
uh, of life, the high quality of services that make Boston an exceedingly uh, pleasant place to live. But you need that, that additional increment every year to keep pace with, with demand on city services. That's fantastic. That's what I thought I heard. I just wanted you to dial down on that. Uh, and then how much of Boston is tax exempt versus taxable? So it seems like we're adding to the tax rolls, which is healthy for the city. But we also have a significant portion of our land, particularly around our colleges, university <coughs> hospitals, that continue to gobble up property, taking it off the tax rolls. It seems like we're offsetting that with that sort of 77 million. But do we have a, a you know, it's 50 50, sure. 51 if 49. You, uh, I think historically that number approximated again because of government buildings and university buildings, medical center buildings, all of which, except for the handful mm -hmm. that are for profit. Uh, are, are tax exempt. I believe the number historically has been um, in the 50% realm. I'm not positive okay. of that. I can certainly get it. Uh, but it, it, it's probably safe to say, it, 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 again, whether you're looking at terra firma, the dirt, or if you're looking at square footage, uh, it's probably over 40% okay. of square and, and footage. And the goal, obviously, minimizing the tax again piece of this is critical for us to continue to move forward with the spending and programming that you referred to. Uh, the council has before it a tax transfer fee. Just maybe a quick snapshot of your thoughts on that. It's some in substance that would establish an investor or a commercial transfer fee and it would impose a 25% purchase, 25% uh, of the purchase price upon transferring a property within 24 months. Didn't know if you've had a chance to review it, but I know it's before the council. At some point we'll be having a hearing. Would love to get, you know, 30 second thoughts on it. Sure, I, I, I think, um, and I'm not, not attempting to take a pass, that really is the, 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 the mayor and the administration's call uh, whether or not it sees merit in that proposal or not. It's, it's uh, from the administration's perspective, their prerogative. From the council's perspective, it's your prerogative. I, I just observe that, that uh, we do really well in this city from a development standpoint. Not only do we get development, residential development, commercial development, institutional development that we ser think serves <coughs> the needs of the city of Boston's people all along the socioeconomic spectrum. We get those structures, but we're also getting significant things out of them. I just pointed out the new tax revenue uh, that's generated. The, if you look just at a snapshot last year, just 2018, January 2018 till the present, so about 15, uh, 16, 17 months. Last year, in addition to the things I just mentioned, housing, jobs, tax revenue, the linkage fund, uh, housing linkage, linkage and jobs linkage has yielded about 35 million new dollars. IDP, the inclusionary development affordability um, requirement last over the past 16 months has yielded over 8 million new dolls and cash. That's in addition to creating units in the new developments. This is IDP cash. Uh, public realm improvements, almost $5 million over the past year, uh, year and a half. Transportation, almost uh, just under $2 million. Community benefits for a variety of organizations, functions, and activities, $2.2 million. Money for parks and open space, uh, about $6 million. Those are the things that we are able to pull from new development. So an additional layering on uh, associated with costs of owning, managing, transferring property, it has to be factored in that there's, there's a lot being extracted out of development. Whether or not this particular the, the pro transfer proposal has, has a harmful effect or not, I, I don't think we have, have really analyzed that mm -hmm. closely enough, but we're always very careful, very cautious about uh, when, when you know, new impositions end up having a negative impact on the things that I just mentioned. You, you don't want to, to put it primitively, you don't want to you know, the, kill the goose that lays right. the golden egg, so we're very careful. We know that, that property development and investment in property in Boston is, is paying a lot of dividends for its people all along the socioeconomic spectrum. We want that to continue. We want this to be workable and yield more and more benefits, not, not uh, ultimately uh, less. Right. Thank you. And you read reference IDP, which <coughs> just want to take the opportunity. I know on behalf of Council Flynn and I, we recognize some scoff laws that were not playing by the rules of the IDP, working with Mike Christopher in your office. And 
you came down pretty hard on them, uh, which we appreciate. Uh, the IDP is there for a reason. We're trying to solve uh, an affordable housing crisis, and when you have uh, developers being cute and skirting it, uh, it warranted uh, prompt and appropriate um, uh, and significant response, and, and you did that. So on behalf of the, the community and also on behalf of the city, because we, by referencing that instance, it opened up uh, to several others uh, that were brought to your attention, and you dealt with it swiftly, so we appreciate that. Thank you very much, Thank Council. you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Councilor Savi George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all uh, for being here today. Can you um, just summarize for me how many small projects and big projects we have going on right now? So uh, small, Article 80 small projects and large projects, I would imagine it's just under 100 right now. So uh, there's a variety of ways of looking at this. What's being built right now uh, versus what's in front of us right now being approved. But at any given time, the number is, is roughly um, 100. Okay. It might be 80 to 100 things in front of us uh, going through the process, seeking ultimate approval by the board. And then once those projects are approved, you might see 80 to 100 underway in the city. I think that's fairly typical of what's been going on for the past five, six years. And it's, um, that's, I mean, I think that sounds like the right number because there is a lot going on, but it's always hard to sort of quantify how much is going on. Have we see, seen any trends to indicate a slowing of development in the city? You know, it's an excellent question, Councillor, and we, we look at the data like everybody else in the private sector and the public sector, trying to discern when the end to this very robust uh, economic climate, this very robust period of, of real estate development comes to an end. What we do know is we're already the longest economic recovery ever since World War II. There, the, we just passed the 10-year mark, I think earlier this calendar year, making us the longest economic recovery since the late 1940s. So, it begs a question, how much longer can it go on? Has the world really changed all that much? Can we anticipate 15-year uh, economic recoveries, 15 years of continuous economic expansion? We don't know. All, all we know right now is we don't see the slowdown. Uh, we, see, we see not only people continuing to permit projects. Last year, we did 12 million. Uh, 12 million square feet of new development approved in the calendar year 2018. That looks an awful lot like the prior five years as far as approvals, very similar numbers. And, but what's important is those numbers aren't just approvals. Developers are taking those Article 80 approvals from the BPDA and going to ISD and pulling their building permits. That's what, you know, we care about back in the the bad old days of 08, 09, 010 when the economy had imploded. People were still doing a lot of permitting work upstairs at the agency. Problem was, no one was turning around getting financing and building the things. They're building them now, and we don't see the slowdown. I can't tell you what it looks like two years from now, but I think if you look at the next 18 months, given what we know is happening outside, there's over 20 million square feet of development underway right now, being built. And you look at the cranes in the sky, and the cranes in the sky are the only things going vertical. There's plenty out there going on without the crane having shown up yet, or the crane's work being completed. So you might have 50 cranes out there. It tells you 50 big projects underway, but there are others just getting going. They get the foundation work on, crane's not there yet. Or they've topped off the building, don't need the crane anymore. Uh, it's about 100. And, and that's, that really continues to move forward unabated. And uh, it, again, if you just look at the average large project, probably takes about two and a half years to build it. We know 20 million square feet of new projects is underway. They take two and a half years to build. They're all at various stages of completion. But I think for the next two years, you're not going to see much change. After that, who knows? Thank you for that. Um, one of the comments that I hear from community meetings across the city is the process, concerns about the process of notification when we talk about how neighbors are finding out about what's happening down the street or around the corner or next door. Can you talk a little bit about the official uh, notification process, what 
constituents, our residents should expect for notification when a project is happening in their neighborhood? Sure. So the, the, the most important thing to keep in mind, we, 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 we have had a process, you know, Article 80 in particular, mm -hmm. if we're talking development, it's been around since, the, since 1996, just over 20 years old. We have a variety of, of, um, of notice requirements associated with the various stages of Article 80, but there are other community proceedings that could occur that, that aren't necessarily governed by that, the, those time frames. So we always strive for ample notice. Notice is, is, is worthless um, if it does not give people ample enough opportunity to understand what's going on and to prepare for it. So that, that informs everything we do. We want process not only to be satisfied uh, on paper, that we, we, we follow uh, process as, as required by our own regs, not to mention on the occasions when other regs govern us uh, at, 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 the, at the state level, but we abide by the rules that we set for ourselves. But if they're, if they're found to be inadequate, we're, and, and if there's a significant concern, we're always open to, to having a conversation about whether more robust notice, either more time or more information is appropriate. But uh, we're, we're very committed to the notion that, that, that our, our very robust processes are only meaningful if people know what's happening and have sufficient time and opportunity to prepare for those conversations in the neighborhood. And I would just add one thing to what Director Golden just said. I think in addition to that, where one of the things we're looking at is um, when we're notifying um, abutters or neighborhood representatives of public meetings, how can we reach them in the languages that are most appropriate to reach them? You heard Lauren speak to a little bit to um, the translation services that are available and interpretive services. We're also looking at what newspapers we are we advertise in. You know, are we reaching? Are we, are we putting the notice where people are likely to find it? And that's something that, um, particularly for community planning and real estate development that we're leading, we're trying to go above and beyond. Thank you. I'll save the rest for next round. Thank you, Council Mal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, Brian, and to your team, thank you for the great work you do. Brian, you touched upon this a little bit in your opening statement. Um, would you mind talking more about sustainability efforts that the BPDA is really sort of uh, helping to drive as it relates to new construction, new development? Sure. So uh, it, we've been working on this for a long time. And, uh, you know, Article 37 sort of blazed the, yeah. the, the, the trail uh, with regard to uh, sustainability needs that are not just in the interest of the city of Boston, not just in the interests of, um, of a, a given neighborhood, they're, the, they're in the private sector for profit interests of developers no to abide by these requirements because it's about protecting their property, protecting against threats to life, uh, safety, and structure. So Article 7, Article 37 has been with us for a number of years. Initial concerns were that it didn't have teeth, that you have a checklist yep. of things we'd like to see you explore as part of your uh, permitting process. But what we have found uh, in, that, in that process is that the vast majority of developers do comply. They do the things that Article 37 seeks because it's in their own self-interest, most have, have found that to be um, a, a very compelling argument and compelling reality that prompts them to take action. Now, as you know, the, the mayor has, uh, at the end of last year, spoke more broadly about resiliency as it relates to uh, Boston Harbor. He announced resilient Boston Harbor mm -hmm. or Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce speech at the end of the mm -hmm. year where he articulate, articulated like the, the 40 plus miles of harbor um, edge uh, for the city are vulnerable. Almost all of it's vulnerable. The, 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 the floodplains, not only that we've looked at in the past, which are retrospective, the FEMA floodplains, they look backwards. We're also looking at floodplains forward. That was part of our, our Imagine Boston 2030 effort. And the, the, the flooding danger looking forward 
is, is, is very disturbing indeed. Bad enough when you're looking at the FEMA maps retrospectively, where have the floods been? Sure. That's scary. Where are the floods going to be? Scarier. So resilient Boston Harbor was articulated as a means of addressing that over time. We don't have to get the answer right tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, but we do have to work systematically day by day to implementing phys physical infrastructure improvements to prevent downtown yeah. Boston and, and, uh, and our neighborhoods that are more proximate to, to the harbor from flooding. So resilient Boston Harbor was kicked off. We played a significant role in that, as well as the city's office uh, of, of environment. And, and we'll, that'll be continue to be in our wheelhouse for as far as the eye can see. We will continue to demand uh, not only that development protect itself from a resiliency standpoint, pretty easy to get developers to do that because it's in their interest. The challenge is to do it more in a more district-wide yep. fashion, a neighborhood fashion, a regional fashion, so that development is making, is contributing to resiliency improvements along the harbor's yep. edge. And, um, so I'm just going to cut you off there, Brian, just because I only have five minutes. Um, but no, I appreciate that and agree with virtually everything you said. I think we're talking about two uh, really distinct but complementary issues here. One is resiliency, how things are built. We've seen, we've seen several hundred year storms within the last several years. Um, but also, as it talks about new development, and like Tim, I'm not going to start thanking people because invariably I will forget somebody, but I will mention John Delzell has done terrific work. He's been a great partner with me as we look at new construction. 80% of all new greenhouse gas emissions come from our buildings. Article 37 is a terrific start, um, but I would say it's just that, a start. We need to add more teeth to it, certainly, and we need to make it harder, and it's one of the reasons why I've been pushing for net zero carbon on all new municipal buildings, for example, which is something that we will continue to do. Um, so I appreciate that, uh, and there, to your point about it making good business sense, there's a market out there. It's also, I think, we're finally seeing community members come up at many of these uh, IAGs or certain community meetings about a development project asking for net zero carbon or asking an electrified system, and we've seen some great success. And there. we see it very similar uh, to, to your way of thinking, Councilor. Yep. As you know, the mayor's articulated a goal of a uh, carbon neutral Boston by uh, 2050. Yep. So we'll remain very We have a lot of work to do, but it's, it's an ambitious goal that I support. Um, That'll be it for this round. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Council Siomo, and thank you to Brian and your, your staff for being here. And um, <clears throat> Brian, I also wanted to highlight um, an employee of the BPDA, John Campbell, who is doing excellent, excellent work. So just want to uh, pass that along to you. And That's to, good uh, to hear. Thank you very much, yeah, Councilor. Thank you. We think highly of him as well as John Delzell, who was just mentioned mm -hmm. by Councilor O'Malley. Thank you very much for the yeah, kind thank words. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And also, I wanted to say thank you to you for not only the work you're doing here, but work on um, helping our military families as well. I know that's an important issue uh, that you've been involved in for 30 years. So thank you for, for doing that, Brian. I appreciate your kind words. Um, Brian, I know Michael mentioned it earlier, but the IDP um, issue in South Boston, one of the developers tried to um, not participate in the program and try to sell a um, affordable unit at a market market rate. So just the enforcement on that type of issue would be would be very important to us. I know you highlighted highlighted it earlier. So that's just something that I'm going to hopefully we can continue working on that. I don't want to see these developers try to um, get out of their obligation of providing affordable housing to our residents. Yeah, you're up, sorry, Councilor. It's a horror show. If we have gone through the process, first of all, we have this IDP requirement. We, we, we impose the IDP requirement on developers seeking to create residential housing through the Article 80 mm -hmm. permitting process and to actually end up losing a unit. Right. Our units is utterly untenable, morally, politically, right. you name it. Uh, that, that, is a, that would be a tragic loss. So uh, there have been these near misses. They're few yeah. and far between, but, but we believe we have the, 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 the responsible business systems in place uh, to prevent such things from okay. going forward. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see another developer try to pull a stunt like that again, especially um, intentionally doing it. You can see if it's a mistake, but 
um, it seems like it was intentional. Um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, Lauren, what you were talking about, uh, language access as it relates to um, the downtown planning process. I saw some of the meetings in Chinatown and you, you had translators and uh, you were engaging in the, with the community in Cantonese and you were engaging with the community in Mandarin. So it didn't go unnoticed by me that um, your outreach to the neighborhood. So I want to say thank you to you and your staff are doing that. And that's something I hope you will Absolutely. continue doing so. Anytime it comes to our attention that there's a type or part of the neighborhood that doesn't speak English primarily, um, you know, we have the resources and we think it's the right thing to do. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for doing that. And Brian, I, the last the last point, um, I have maybe one, a, a couple of developments in my district with expiring use um, um, apartment buildings that over a period of time that um, affordable units, um, the price of them now have, has, has left the time frame, if I'm saying it right. Um, and is there, is there something that the city or the BPDA is doing to ensure that those residents that have been there for so many years now because the unit might be affordable or market rate um, would be potentially be evicted. So I want to see what your thoughts are on, on that type of issue. So, Councillor, I'm going to speak a little bit from my previous experience with apartment neighborhood development. But the answer is yes, absolutely. So one thing that we've done in our mayor's housing plan is identify every um, expiring use of property in, in the entire city and its risk of um, a loss. So many expiring use properties are owned by CDCs yep. or you know, other mission-oriented developers. There's a relatively low likelihood that even if the use restriction expired that that would result to a conversion to market rate. But we're working with those property owners nonetheless to extend those restrictions. But there are a few and, and several in your district um, uh, uh, owners, private owners of affordable properties uh, which have near-term ex expiration dates. The, uh, the articulated goal of the administration is to preserve 97% of all of those units. A couple of, of losses are inevitable, but there's a whole team at D&D, a couple of staff members who really work on nothing but this issue. And, and well, I can't speak to the particular properties. I'm sure they'd be, they'd be happy to meet with you and talk through every the, the strategy for each building and what, um, what can be accomplished to keep the, the tenants protected and to keep those units protected. Yeah, that's something I'd like to do if I'm able to meet with you and um, D&D to go over each, each unit or each development in my district. Um, I'd like to see a short-term plan and a long-term plan on yeah. what you're doing and ways that we can make sure that no one gets evicted, especially our elderly, our disabled, Absolutely. our yeah. immigrant community as well. That's a great point. Um, thank you, and I'll, thank I can you. wait for the next round. Is, uh, is there any reason we can't name this developer? Uh, I think we should know who he is if he's lurking in any of our neighborhoods. I, I must admit, I'm, I'm not sure of the actual entity's name. Okay. Not off the top of my head. And Eddie could if he wanted to. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk. Okay. okay, all right, I think, I think it should be known. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I like the fact that there's actually some development going on in my neighborhood now, some good development. Um, Brian, you, you had talked about, and how do you quantify, you, you, you mentioned um, public realm improvement, traffic improvements, those sorts of things, and you put actual dollar amounts on them. Is that, is that going through each project and putting a dollar amount on, on yes. all the improvements? So literally an aggregate of everything that's happened across the city. So those numbers I just rattled off for you were January 2018 to the present. I just have that as a snapshot. Yeah, of, and that's a, of, that was a one-year snapshot. Correct, about a little less than a year and a half. Though, and, and I think it's worth understanding what comes out of the development above and beyond the economic impact right. of the construction jobs, the jobs that are going into the commercial and institutional space, and the, and the property taxes, and, and even the IDP. There's a lot more that is usually extracted to benefit the immediate surroundings or the neighborhood that is hosting the project. And, and 
people should just know that, that there actually is more to it. Yeah, and, and I mean, we know that because a lot of times we're in the middle of negotiating all that, but it's good, it's good to hear an actual right. number. Yeah, that's why I thought, I, I know, I certainly know you all realize what is extracted throughout mm. the development process, but to just see it all told for the past 16 months, because I, I had not seen that number until yeah, yeah. this morning. Because public realm, public realm, you know, good sidewalks, good streets go a long way you know, in, in, in any neighborhood, I would think. Um, can you talk a little bit, Brian, about Glover's Corner? I know that those recommendations were supposed to, or maybe it's you, Lauren, those recommendations were supposed to be rolled out. I know there was some <laughs> angst around there. Were they rolled out? Well, yeah, so preliminary recommendations have been presented to the community. Um, we have not issued a draft plan document yet, but that is coming. Um, we do know that we have some more outreach we still need to do, and that's underway. Um, so pending that outreach, I can't really give a, a date certain yeah. when we'd be moving forward, but it is our intention, and we do feel that you know, a large portion of your constituency also agrees that um, the plan is a good plan and it should uh, move to its conclusion. Yeah, so will you talk a little bit, Lauren, about um, one of the, of course, the issues, uh, it's, you know, just gentrification, displacement, and affordability. We don't need to get into those. We could speak all night on them. But so, what are we doing um, for the affordability piece? What is that? What is that going to look like? So again, that that's very much in process, and we are working with um, Chief Dillon and the Department of Neighborhood Development to kind of come up with, you know, what's the recipe for something that we can present to the community to make um, make it certain so that the advocates feel like they've been addressed. Um, in addition, it's obviously very important to combat gentrification to the extent that we can, um, but I think at least having a good plan in place allows us to help developers and have a little bit of predictability both for them and the community as projects do continue to move forward there. Um, can someone, while we're on it, can someone uh, give me a definition of gentrification? It's not just changing neighborhoods, so when, it, yes, I went there. Um, <laughs> So, when, when, when my neighborhood changed in 1970, from the 70s to the 80s, it changed, changed again in the 80s, changing again in the 90s, changing again now in, 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 you know, in this time. So I, that I think, wasn't gentrification when my neighborhood changed, or what, can you? I think in, in we've all had this conversation many, many times internally, and I, I think maybe one of the, there's, um, there's a difference between economic investment in neighborhoods, which is often a positive thing, and the displacement of residents that have lived there for the long term, which is absolutely a bad thing. So I think part of the, um, the, 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 the strategy that the BPDA tries to meet on our housing goals with D&D and across the board whenever we're having these conversations is how to encourage investment in neighborhoods and not, mm -hmm. not discourage it, uh, encourage the growth of our city. You heard a lot, Brian talk a lot about why that's really, really important, not just um, from a, from a sort of world view sense, but also just from a dollars and cents sense to, to, the, uh, to the city's budget, but to do that in a way that protects people who have lived in the city for generations and so the, the benefits of, those, of that growth accrue to the people that live here now. And that's, I think, something that is common across all of our efforts and any, any, whether it's site-specific development planning, real estate planning, neighborhood-wide or, or city-wide planning, that's something that we're, we're always wrestling with. Okay. There's a lot more there, but we'll you, leave You're right, Council. We literally could go on yeah. and on because this is discussed and debated often. What is, what is gentrification? Yeah, so like Clearly, redlining and was that gentrification when we went from, uh, 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 you know, like a, a middle class Jewish neighborhood, Roxbury, to pre predominantly, a, you know, a black lower class neighborhood? Was that gentrification? I would imagine, I would imagine there's an argument for everything. It's a, it, it's a very subjective term, I think, often. I'm sure there's a dictionary, you know, definition of it, but it's, it, it's a subjective call whether, and to Devin's point, the, 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 the piece about the gentrification conversation that usually absorbs us most is the piece about displacement. Yeah. The gentrification, i.e., which usually means the arrival of large numbers of new residents who tend to be more affluent than the existing population, thereby displacing the existing population. I think that's a fairly conventional way to look at it, not, not maybe a complete definition, but 
We, there, there are plenty of people out there who would argue, hey, even if those new arrivals, those new affluent arrivals are going to a new product, so they're not displacing anyone, some will still have a big problem with that because they think, they believe, you know, in good faith often, that at the arrival of affluent new folks in the neighborhood in buildings for those affluent new folks, a higher price point, has an effect throughout the older residential housing stock and drives prices up and thereby, if not directly, sort of indirectly causing displacement. So that's what we're always wrestling with. Even if the new arrivals are not taking the units occupied by the longer term residents, it is often viewed as menacing. It's sort of a leading indicator of what's gonna come into the older residential stock. We'd argue something that needs to be kept in mind as well is, look, we're, we're adding about eight or 9,000 people to the city, net gain eight or 9,000 people every year. And that's been about 60,000 people since 2010. It's 65,000 new Bostonians net gain since 2010. There, they, they, there's a large contingent of that population that's very affluent. They're going to go somewhere and they're going to drive the prices up on rentals and purchase opportunities in the existing neighborhoods if we don't add stock to absorb that population. That's a really important part of the conversation. It's not the only way of dealing with the issue, but building new stock is an absolute must for addressing some yeah. of the So, so the large development stock block, Glover's Corner, we could argue that there's no housing there now where most of, where most of it is. If, the, if, if, and I don't think Glover's Corner should be heavy housing. I think it should be about one quarter housing. The rest of it should be industry and jobs and, and that sort of stuff. But um, the argument would be if those were not built out in there, then the neighborhood could potentially gentrify, the, the, the surrounding neighborhoods could mm -hmm. potentially Gentrify, whichever way you look at that definition of gentrify, could gentrify more quickly. Correct. I mean, you, you look at um, uh, Councillor Flynn's district, especially, well, um, in lots of parts of that, there's gentrification. There are new arrivals. It happened in the 80s, particularly at the South End. The South End might be the, the sort of most pure version of what people think of when they think of gentrification. Um, affluent, um, affluent new population arrives, a lower income population is displaced. There you have gentrification without a lot of new construction. Yeah. Not a lot of new residential buildings to absorb those who desire to live in the South End. So those who des desire to live in the South End in the late 70s through the late 80s, not to mention right up to the present, but that, that period where the South End radically transformed. It was, there was no new significant development going on, but it was new population displacing an older, longer yes. term. Building by building, every, every building was a displacement. So, so market forces yield that outcome without, you know, frankly, a suite of, of tools to address the problem. We've got IDP, we have a variety of tools we use to address <clears throat> the needs of existing populations that may have lower incomes than the new arrivals, but at the same time, part of that conversation must involve creating new units mm -hmm. for those new arrivals so there's less displacement of the existing population within the existing um, residential development. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just to follow up on that, so the, what's the demographic of the largest um, population growth coming into the city of Austin? Uh, I'm sorry. So in other words, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my understanding is the largest demographic of all of the new arrivals into the city of Austin are um, empty nesters, older folks. Um, do you have any demographic information? We, we about certainly those can get that to you. We talk about demographics constantly. As you know, we right. employ a demographer within our right. research department right. because demography is destiny. 
we need to understand what the needs are from a from a, a job creation standpoint, from a, a housing creation standpoint. Mm -hmm. What does Boston need by 2030 and right. beyond? Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. That that's an enormous part. The re the return to the city of the empty nester, downsizing, mm -hmm. selling the house in the suburb, and moving to the one or two bedroom mm -hmm. downtown. That's a piece of the story. I think it is interesting also that of those roughly 8,000 new arrivals, net gain of 8,000 new people, because of course there's out migration, there's in migration, it's a net gain of 8,000. A third of the new arrivals every year are foreign born. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think the empty nester will be a significant piece mm -hmm. of the new arrivals into the city within the political boundaries of the city of Boston, but a third of those new arrivals are foreign born. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. That, that's a that is a different demographic cohort, and I would argue it's probably a pretty big one if it's a third. I'm not right. sure the empty nesters would be that big. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I, I can get you more that. like 20 something percent or, or or such, and young professionals being probably the the least of the demographic. I I don't know. We but can break I, that love, down. We can probably break it down easily because obviously that has to inform you know, the development climate. I'm sure developers look at that sure. very closely, obviously. But let me uh, recognize Councilor Asabi George. Thank you, um, and thank you again for your thoroughness and your responses to all the questions from my colleagues. I've got thank you, quite a few notes here. Um, one piece that I've been working on um, in partnership with Councilor O'Malley and Councilor Janey is artist housing and artist uh, workspace or live space, workspace, and live workspace. We talk a little bit about the BPDA's role in supporting live and live work and workspace and what opportunities there are to either strengthen that housing, solidify um, that housing for the long term because we've had a number of pro uh, developments or projects um, expire and what we can do to solidify it, for, grow it for the future, strengthen it. Sure, and for, for a long time the agency has worked, uh, uh, this goes back decades, to create not only uh, our IDP program uh, deals with uh, populations of modest and lower incomes generally, but we also, uh, depending on the nature of the development and location of the development and the calls within a community, for artist live workspace often, which also has an affordability component. This, we've been dealing with this for the better part of a few decades. And you know, I, I had a meeting this morning with some Fort Point folks. There are three buildings in Fort Point, three buildings that have 200 artist units in them. That, I mean, that's a very vibrant ecosystem. Uh, that, that's quite an artist community. And that's just in the three buildings. There are other, uh, there are other artists live, work, uh, populations and, and space in the Fort Point area above and beyond those three buildings. But that's what we tend to think of when we think of, of, of housing that is specifically, specifically carved out as a part of a real estate development uh, approval process. We think often of Fort Point. It's kind of a, it's an, an arts community within the city. But this, this actually- I will add, we also think of, and, and what brought my attention to this um, issue is a year, a year and a half ago now, there was a small community in Jamaica Plain that was being displaced yes. for mm -hmm. future development, and, and their, the property wasn't protected in any way, there weren't any deed restrictions. Sure. Um, and so th those are the things that are really concerning to um, the artist community here in the city of Boston. Right, especially when you're dealing with one that, uh, these, also, these also are created organically. One of, one of the buildings mm -hmm. I referenced right. in, in Fort Point, I think there's 80 units. There are 80 units of rental, 100% artists, but it's purely private. It, it, it has nothing to do with uh, a regulatory control placed by the BPDA on that development as a condition of approval was private. This was created as a rental development for artists. So it, there is that piece of the demand satisfied by the market and there's the piece of the demand satisfied by us in our imposition of controls. It happens in every neighborhood. We've had um, some significant success with the creation of artist uh, housing in my home neighborhood, in Alston Brighton, in the Rug Road, Braintree Street 
area over near the New Balance campus. We've even had it at the Westinghouse plant. There were dozens of artists live, work, loft housing in former industrial space at the Westinghouse plant in Reedville. So where there's a demand, where, we, where there's an opportunity, we, we seek to address it as part of the uh, approval um, uh, process and often by also placing on it an IDP income restriction um, uh, that makes it affordable for the artist population as well. But I'm going to ask Yeah, Lauren I was to just going to add, you know, in addition to these regulatory aspects, sorry, I shouldn't lean back, um, we're even engaging with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture earlier on in our planning uh, studies to talk about what the potential opportunities are. It's not always housing. Sometimes it's just actual maker space. Um, but we're keenly aware of it and want to support it as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, um, Council Siomo, and thank you again to uh, Brian and, and your staff. Um, Brian, is there any um, consideration? I know, I know you talked about it earlier, um, the growing population of the South Boston waterfront. Um, every year the population seems to, uh, <coughs> seems to grow significantly. I had an op opportunity to talk to um, the fire commissioner <laughs> today at a hearing about po possibly having a firehouse <coughs> down in the South Boston waterfront based on the growing population. But any, any thoughts that you have, not whether we should have one or not, but just on the growing population of the, of the South Boston waterfront lacking some services, the police lacking, lacking fire, but as the population grows, um, the, there's no question, Council, that as the population grows, the, the sort of public service infrastructure necessary to s support that population will grow with it. And, and, and obviously the, the seaport has grown radically in right. the past decade to, to dozen years or so. Uh, your, your, your colleague uh, from South Boston, in the, who, who represents South Boston in the State Senate, uh, Senator Nick Collins, has often raised concerns about uh, the need for a library. The public library. Uh, the, the fire commissioner has, has expressed interest in beginning to think about a location and a means of supporting the creation and operation of a new um, fire station in and around uh, the seaport. So you know, there is a, there's a major fire station just on the other side of the Greenway. Yeah, right, uh, right. There, there is a concern about uh, rush hour movement of those fire trucks over the Moakley Bridge and into the seaport. Uh, that, is, that is a legitimate concern. But it is, there, there are fire stations uh, fairly proximate as well in South Boston, yeah. you know, close to yeah, Broadway. D Street and um, right. 4th Street. So, but as time goes on, we, uh, again, the, the, the evolution of the, the, the development in the seaport has been a little unusual and it was a little surprise to us. Those who've worked on planning and development issues in the seaport for 20 years, Rich McGinnis, who's our Deputy Director of Planning uh, for, for Waterfront and Climate Change, Rich has been involved in those for 20 years. Early on, in the late 90s, there was a feeling that residential development would occur more robustly first, followed by commercial. That isn't what happened. By the time the economy sort of sorted itself in the 08, 09 timeframe, the, the appetite for development over there was actually commercial. A whole lot of R&D, Vertex, and PwC, and Manulife, financial services. All of a sudden, it was an office, in a commercial office ecosystem. Now, we are seeing more residential. We thought the residential would be first, probably followed by mm -hmm. commercial. It was the opposite. The commercial came first, and now we're seeing a lot of residential. So that population, the residential population of the seaport will easily double in the next several years, and we're going to have to be intentional about what the public services are that that population needs. The population is, is relatively uh, small now as far as full-time residential population in the seaport. It's, uh, you know, the, the population writ large when you think of who goes to work there is large. But it's, it's still, I think, under, well under 10,000 people living there. Uh, but that's going to grow by leaps and bounds and those yeah. services will have to happen. But uh, it, it, the fire commissioner, 
the library, we, we have these conversations yeah. constantly with our in an interagency, interdepartmental and fashion. I, I met with Chief Hooley yesterday at the budget um, hearing and asked him about the having an EMS presence down there as well. There's a lot, as you know, there's a lot of activity, a lot of businesses, a lot of residents. Yeah difficult to get a ambulance there as well and the growing growing population um, also a public library um, police presence but as the population continues to grow based on the the data that you're providing at some point um, we're going to need we're going to need basic city services uh, so councilor one thing we're we're looking at is also how our real estate portfolio can support these public safety agencies and what their um, objectives are so so we've had some conversations with chief Hooley about locating ems stations in the marine park and whether that might be feasible we also this is not in your district but in charlestown we um, are uh, undergoing a community process to put out the ems station that is at the corner of Mishwam Street and Main Street out for redevelopment. It's, it's on BPA owned land, and the um, requirement would be to deliver back an EMS station that's twice the size, so doubling the amount of emergency. One, one of the best buildings, I, I think, in Boston is um, Shafaro's building, International Place, and they they had the, the firehouse and the and EMS yes. house yeah. um, r right there, and they built built up. Is that something you would consider doing? Yeah, that, there's, a, there's an effort underway to explore um, housing with public assets partnerships between where, where uh, public real estate can support mixed-use development that might include residential or might include commercial, like the International Place example. So that's certainly a model that we're looking at. And, and in the case of the Charlestown EMS station, full steam ahead on exploring and then looking at how do we might also do that in the Marine Park as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Brian, back on back on Glover's Corner. What what are the advocates asking? What is their percentage of affordable they're looking for? I, or I Lauren? Wanna, yeah, I wanted, it was very very high. Um, I believe it was sixty five. Sixty five. It may have been that high. Yeah. So, so I thought it was at least fifty, Councillor. Yeah. And it, it's not just the percentage of units that must be restricted, affordable, deed restricted, income restricted, affordable. It's the, it's the depth of the affordability. Yeah. How yeah. deep is the affordability? Is it 70% of area median income or is it 30% of area median income? Because that is a radically different um, economic effect on the potential so for So are they looking, they're looking at both, I think both it was. Areas. I think it was, I think it was deep affordability and a high percentage of affordability. And is, and is that what, um, is it the Eggleston Square planning process? What was that one? The, um, you think of the J.P. Rocks. J.P. Rocks. Mm -hmm. what, what, that was, was much, that was significantly lower than 65%. <laughs> so has but that been codified into language? Do they have recommendations over there? Where is that project? So that's the uh, plan, J.P. Rocks. Um, we have a plan document and guidelines. Um, but we didn't actually settle on that high, um, and we have been seeing projects going through, but that's such a much lower level. So <laughs> projects within that within that that space within that the was JP, within Jamaica Plain, yes. Yeah. In yeah. the JP Rocks plan, I believe it was 22% yeah. of private development would be affordable housing. There was a goal to create more affordable housing than that because there's actually sub a substantial degree of publicly owned land yeah. in the JP Rocks area. Which is and then you could, then you can bump your numbers exactly. up if it's publicly owned, right. and, and that's is, there's one publicly owned site in the Glover's Corner area. But there's that other than that, there's not a lot of public real estate to leverage in that same way that we did in the J.P. Rock's planning yeah. process. Okay, so we'll stay, we'll stay tuned to that one there. Um, Trin, how are you today? Very good, thank you. Good, <laughs> good. Can you talk, Trin, can you talk, and I'm excited to work with you in the next however long we're working together. Uh, can you talk a little bit what, what like the city's doing for training people to come into uh, city jobs? We talked about the, the, the city academy. Will you, will you talk about that a little bit? Yes, sure. Um, about a year ago, um, actually a year and a half ago, um, with uh, the support and leadership of Director Golden, um, we had did a planning on the rate of retirement of um, departments in the city of Boston. We did the Department of Public Works, um, Boston Police Department, the library, Boston Housing Authority, Boston Water and Sewer, and found that within seven to 10 years, the rate of retirement of uh, city workers were about 35 to 55%, depending on which field. 
And so um, we were looking at, and a lot of department heads were looking at, how to um, prepare and retain a diverse talent pool so that we can do some succession planning. Um, and so um, the mayor and department heads collaboratively uh, created the City Academy, which um, trains Boston residents into entry-level positions that don't necessarily require a bachelor's degree. Um, and we started with uh, three tracks, uh, commercial driver's license and heavy equipment for the Department of Public Works. Also, the second track is the EMTs, the medical technicians with Chief Hooley's department. And the last one is um, job readiness for the Boston Police Department, the fire department, so that high school students can learn more about these industries and these fields. Um, hopefully that will also um, add on to um, the bus drivers and also uh, teachers aid with the Boston public school systems. Uh, All through the City Academy, the bus drive is also through the City Academy. Yes, but that's... With, with that first track that you talked about, the... Yes, but that's still in the planning process mm -hmm. because we are having conversations with collective bargaining. And so hopefully the developments that my colleagues and Director Golden is talking about in terms of um, you know, looking at developments and the, uh, the economic prosperities that we're seeing that the linkage dollars from these developments uh, will go into job training and affordable housing, but particularly job training so that those developments and those linkage fees can be then reinvested into Boston residents and career pipelines. Um, and so we're building a way in which it comes to a full circle that, you know, not just a few individuals or a few sector of people in Boston gets to uh, reap the benefits of the economic vitality, but making sure that that is equally allocated across the city of Boston. So the City Academy is one of many programs in which the mayor and under the director of, um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Director Golden is to ensure that that economic prosperity is equally shared uh, across the city. Nice, now is that City Academy, is that, is that in a, a building that we own and is it operated by us in the city or do we contract that out? We um, operated uh, kind of in various spaces, 43 Hawkins Street, and then also we rent a space in Roxbury called 7 Palmer Street, which is the Roxbury Center. Um, and then we actually contract the commercial driver's license out. Mm -hmm. um, and then where, where is that? Where is that contract? That's in Avon, the Parker School in Avon. Okay. And so we've in, been in conversation with you on how do we get that back into the city of Boston if yeah. we find a qualified vendor and trainer. Um, and then with the EMT, we have that training directly at Chief Hooley's um, space, office space. Good, good. Um, so with, uh, how much can, how much comes in, how much came in last year in, in, um, in work training money? About, um, it averages depending on um, the neighborhood's job trust, but last year approximately 2.2 .2 million. Yeah, and, and is, that about, is that about where we've been for the last couple of years, up, up or down a little bit? I, I think in the last five years, I've been in this position in the chair, uh, the um, chair trustee of NJT for about five and a half years. And I would be comfortable to say that we average about 2.7 million just because development has been very pros prosperous. And obviously um, what we do is one of the major criteria in that reinvestment is um, we look at leverage dollars. So for, for, for example, um, for every one dollar of linkage dollars that we invest in uh, job training, we leverage pri um, about seven dollars of, of private money, state or federal funds. Um, uh, comparatively, that we're able to go out and get through grants or whatever correct. else, so our one dollar <laughs> becomes eight dollars. Correct, and that is uh, very similar to our investment um, with our um, tuition-free community college, so which also comes from leverage funds um, from linkage and neighborhood jobs trust. So, for example, one dollar into tuition-free community college leverages at least seven to nine dollars of Pell federal grants. And so we kind of use those dollars very wisely. Is that where most of that, that seven dollars is coming from when we're talking about the, the free the free tuition? Correct. Plan? It comes from uh, the federal Pell grants. Okay. Thank you. Help. Council Flynn. Thank you, Council CMO, and um, thank you again, Brian. Um, Brian, is your office, um, I know the, there was a rally recently in Chinatown about preserving the row houses. 
Is there any updates on, on that situation? I was there with Sheila Dillon and with Council of Flaherty, and um, as you know, there are um, a lot of immigrant residents that are living there, a lot of elderly, a lot of disabled, and unfortunately being priced out or evicted by, by wealthy owners coming in and trying to exploit the neighborhood. Um, so it's very, very discouraging. We were able to build, you know, Ritz Carlton um, Hotel, um, but can we can we save these row houses? Um, so I would just um, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily any updates on that. Other than I would just reiterate that you know we're committed to preserving the cultural heritage of Chinatown, and that's part of the reason that we expanded the original plan downtown boundaries to include. Chinatown um, further towards the turnpike, um, but additionally that, you know, through the lens of preserving, when we proceed forward with our scenario planning for plan downtown, those row houses are, you know, critically important and we look at them as a cultural asset. So it's not, we don't really have the power as the BPDA to step in and say you can't, you know, sell these or you can't move forward, especially because with Nine Johnny Court, it was zoning compliant except for needing an administrative permit for groundwater conservation. Right. Um, but you know, our, all of our planning staff understands um, when they review projects right there to pay attention and you know be sensitive to that. Yeah, right. Yeah, if we could pay close attention to some of those issues, I know the the neighborhood was exploited during that Airbnb issue as well by by the by the business community. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're able to um, pay attention closely to, to that neighborhood. Um, what, are, what are we doing on preserving small businesses in Boston? I had a recent case of a, um, a gentleman who was um, on Tyler Street and almost evicted by, by the landlord. And um, Sheila Dillon was, was, was helping me on it. We were able to um, keep, keep him in there. But you know, as prices go up in the city, these small business owners that have a, a, a clientele that may not have a lot of money, uh, they're also being priced out of their out of their business. That's that's a, a great point, Councillor, and it's a point that kind of uh, echoes back to the, count, the point that Councillor Baker was making around displacement. Because I think often when we think of displacement, we think of people living in neighborhoods, but there's a whole business, right. uh, 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 sort of legacy business, cultural business, a component to displacement that's frankly a little bit harder to uh, address. Um, there, there are certain standards that you use to establish um, affordable housing criteria and how do you, how you create income restricted units for people at, at making certain amounts of money, but the same thing doesn't exist for, um, for businesses because to some extent uh, it, it, businesses should be allowed to fail if they're not a thriving business, but at the same time we want to make sure that businesses that are um, been in our neighborhoods for a very long time, we're given the most opportunity to succeed. So there's a, it's a little bit harder of a, um, of a, of a policy to craft. That said, it's something that's come up a lot um, in planning studies and uses of public real estate. It's something that's really read, led by the Office of Economic Development and their small business unit. So and that, um, I think that team has probably the, the, the closest understanding of the on the ground, what are the next mm -hmm. things that we can do. But, but across this team's work, certainly in our real estate development work, um, and, it, and we're looking at keeping legacy tenants, keeping keeping uh, rents moderate. We're developing new spaces on publicly owned real estate, like we are in Dudley Square. Um, having the opportunity for um, startup incubator bases, uh, businesses step into those spaces, or maybe the opportunity for small businesses to become owners of their spaces rather than renters. These are all things that, that we've we've talked about. Yeah, would 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 that include some type of technical assistance or? Um, tax assistance, tax breaks for long-time business owners, women business owners, um, communities of color that own, that own businesses that have been here for a long, a long period of time. I have a lot of women business owners in, in South Boston, a lot, of, um, a lot in Chinatown as well, um, in the South End, all, throughout, throughout the city. But um, you know, if we're able to give assistance to other companies, couldn't we consider giving some type of technical assistance to um, small businesses. Yeah, that's not a, a, a 
sort of the tax structure agreement or incentives are not something that I have a ton of expertise with, but that's certainly a great question and something we could we could. But that's that D and D does some of that, that don't they? The office of economic development. Yeah. Okay. Under John Brown. Another thing I'd like to point out, Councilor, this is this is uh, very much sort of in the early stages from a public policy evolution standpoint. The notion of affordable commercial space mm -hmm. as a restriction within the zoning code are within planning uh, guidelines. The, the, we, we explored it over in uh, the JP Rocks. Uh, Harrison Albany. Harrison Albany, I'm sorry. Did we do it in JP Rocks as well? I thought that was I think a... there might have been an element, but none of it, we haven't seen anything get realized. Okay. There's Harrison Albany, a little bit. At Harrison Albany, JP Rocks, we've, we've embraced this notion that uh, in the same way that we might require uh, uh, deed restricted affordable units in a mm -hmm. residential building that you provide even in new development, not just protecting old, but pr in new, finding a home for uh, small local businesses at an affordable price point that right. normally would not occur if you were purely reliant on market forces in a new structure. So new structures almost always by definition mean high prices unless there's some kind of policy intervention. So we've tried that a few times. One of the complications associated with that is when we do affordable units of housing, we can figure out um, sort of a price. We look at 80% of AMI, we look at 70% of AMI. We know what area of median income is and we can calibrate the affordability of the unit accordingly using that sort of well understood concept. But what is the, its equivalent when it comes to a commercial mm -hmm. business? How do you identify what's affordable okay. and, and, and what should be uh, a reasonable price point for a small local, you know, mom and pop or right. a bodega in, in JP. Uh, so we continue to sort of explore that because it's, it, that, that, that's more of a brave new world than the housing piece is of that equation. But we, we think it's just as important that you go to these neighborhoods where small residential building with first floor retail right. is, is, is being redeveloped you run into these problems somewhat frequently. Yeah, that's, that was the case recently. There was a, um, a gentleman that owned a hairstylist um, on Tyler Street being, being evicted and, um, you know, didn't have money for a lawyer. And, you know, you saw all these women, Chinese uh, women, that were literally paying his, his legal bills. They were coming up to the store and giving him $3 or $5 to, for his legal defense. I mean, it was, it was great to see that. But... Um, how many times can can we continue doing that? Is is there a better way that we can represent him? Um, is there any type of um, financial assistance if there are legal issues for these small businesses that we can help them with? I do believe that Office of Economic Development has a technical assistance program. Now, and whether that covers legal fees, I, I'm not aware, but they do give small targeted grants to say, if, you, if a, a, a longtime local business needs help sort of looking at the retail strategy or their marketing strategy, those are things that exist and that's a great idea is that it, it should be something that passed along to, to the Office of Small Business mm -hmm. Development. Do they, could they also include legal fees in that? The one other thing, Council, I'd just like to throw mm -hmm. out there, we do have a small entity within the BPDA, the BLDC, and the BLDC has loan making capacity. Right. It very often is the, the, the destination of last resort. Conventional banks, conventional lenders may not, uh, may not uh, provide the, the debt, the lending to the, the small business that they need, but we might see it as a reasonable um, risk and, and provide assistance through that mechanism. And, and we do it all the time. Well, thank you, Brian, and, and to your staff for taking my questions. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me see where I am here. Devin, maybe you want to talk about this. Public assets with, with private residences. Are you guys involved in Upham's Corner? Because that, to me, looks like it's going to be a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the BPDA does have a property in the Upland's Corner. That effort's being led by um, the Office of Economic Development as well. But the idea of doing uh, housing with public assets is certainly something that we're really excited about in both the city's real estate portfolio and the BPDA's real estate portfolio. How can we create um, public-private partnerships that get more than one thing done? 
Um, there are, I think there's a couple different flavors of that. There's the um, uh, public-private partnership that helps fund a improvement to a capital asset that it doesn't have to come out of the, uh, the, the capital budget. I think a good example of that is the, the Main Street in Charlestown example where the, the community benefit of new development at that location will be the expansion uh, at the, um, of that EMS station, which will not come at any public expense. Mm -hmm. um, other e examples might be where the public assets might be able to uh, create new housing, perhaps new affordable housing, in combination with an, a, uh, a capital program that was already envisioned. So if we're going to go out and build a new library, well, should there be housing above that library? And that's something that and, and what is are being some of the explored. challenges? Like, so what? What are the major roadblocks in pulling something like that off? I know it's always financing. How do you pay for it? If you can pay yep. for it, you can get it done. Is that the is that the major roadblock? Or what I think else it's is there? both financing and I think another major. Uh, I wouldn't call it a roadblock, but something that we need to be mindful of and, and very thoughtful about is how we are compliant with uh, Massachusetts state law when it comes to the procurement of um, uh, of new uh, public services, new pu new public real estate. There's there's lots of law that covers how uh, new uh, public real estate will be built, and we need to make sure that any investment we do in, that's a public-private partnership is compliant with that law. Um, so there's, that, that's something that the Public Facilities Department has been looking very closely into. So, so, so how you get control of the land and also how it's yeah, built? Yeah, exactly, yes. how it's built at prevailing wage, who is building it, how the sub-bidders are bid out. There are things that might preclude um, some residential developers from even wanting to participate in that. And you mean so because be, they might not want to Exactly. They might, they might not want to jump through all the hoops that the city might require in, in how the public construction process is funded and, and, and overseen. Um, so there, that's the, finding the right strategy to deal with those issues is one, one uh, important way of addressing it, keep being compliant with that law. Um, another is to sort of address this as the sale of public real estate and the um, the benefits that come back from it. So it's not necessarily publicly constructed. No public dollars go into the construction of the new uh, public assets. Yeah, which would be above, you're talking yeah, about exactly. housing. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, hopefully we can, and so, is it is it economic development solely that's that's running that RFP process and that, that bidding process? Is, is BPDA involved in that also? That, that one's a partnership between uh, Office of Economic Development BPDA and the Department of Neighborhood Development, who are the and the Public Facilities Department. So every, every everybody's going to be there. Yeah, absolutely, okay. um, Lauren. This might be for you. Are we are we um, involved in the UMass build out yet? Have we have we been in contacted? Have we been contacted by any of those teams yet? What what is our involvement going to be? So I've I've been interim for just under three months now, and I have not. Okay, so then that question's for Brian. Brian, do we? <laughs> no. We so, have, yeah. so, so 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 I think they may have just awarded the RFP, uh, or, or or made it formalized. Sure, so they designated I, a yes, developer. Yes, it's, it's all designated. But I think the um, due diligence period is over. So my question is. Uh, because it's because it's a state asset, you know. But we, one of the big asks um, of the community and the and the stakeholders was that we make sure we have a a, a process over there that the community is going to be able to weigh in on. So, have you guys started? Uh, uh, the, the, the initial discussions with the developers over there? Very preliminary, Councillor. About four weeks ago, so after University of Massachusetts designated the developer, I met very briefly with them, sort of a general, the road from here. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know when the actual closing could yeah. occur or the, um, the, the consummation of the deal. But it's just been announced. We know who the developer is likely to be, assuming due diligence goes well. So it's just a very preliminary conversation. We know they have grand ambitions, as does the university has grand ambitions for that location. It's going to be their neighbor. Um, transformative, all the words we're used to hearing when we think of large-scale development on a, on a broad piece of terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still early, and the, 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 to your point, the ground rules are what's really important. Yeah. The mayor, and I was present 
when the mayor had these conversations in the past with the University of Massachusetts, mayor feels very strongly, as does the Boston Planning and Development Agency, there must be a very robust um, community process. And, uh, in, and I must admit, I don't know off the top of my head if this is envisioned as a long-term land lease or is it an outright? Yeah, if it's, it's, a, an, it's a long-term land lease. If it's, an, if it's an outright sale, then obviously the private developer is well within our yeah. you know, jurisdiction yeah. for development oversight. So it's a land lease, so UMass still has the... That's right. It could, in theory, assert its sovereign immunity from our process, right. which we would think is not a good way to go yeah, for we, UMass or for the city. But we see no sign of that. Yeah. The, 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 the indications from the university, the indications from the developer, Everybody wants to cooperate with the city on a robust process uh, that yields development that benefits all. Yeah. And so we're, we're very optimistic that everybody is going to engage in a cooperative, collaborative and, and, relationship. And, and that's what I see over there also, but I, I would have to just kind of make sure that, that um, and asking for help. Mm -hmm would be that, that we have constant talk with the state, uh, Mass DOT, because if the development happens over there, and, and I think most of your agency knows me, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-development, I, I, I wanna see investment happen, especially in my neighborhoods. Um, but if a project goes over there that's three million square feet or more or less, we potentially in that part of Dorchester could be stuck on that side of the city. So without without road improvements, Kazusko Circle and, and, and Marcy Boulevard, without the ground rules for all that up front, meaning talking about all that stuff now before we get into what the building's gonna look like. So Yeah, I would just add Councillor Baker, you know, the Columbia Point master plan is uh, dated somewhat at this point, yeah. but a lot of those uh, implementation actions are still valid and we would obviously look to that as a starting point for guiding us, you know, through the process with those developers. Yeah, and I'm not looking to stay to the letter of the law with the, with, yep. with the master plan. The master plan, I think, got the neighborhood ready for density mm -hmm. and, and that sort of stuff, which was, which was good, but I think we could even come up with something, yep. something better now with UMass involved there, but if we don't have an active team that's dedicated to that, you know, to Kazusko Circle, to Marcy Boulevard, dealing with this project, then, then it, it might get away with us, get away from us. So I just want to stress that. There's no, um, there's no daylight between your position and ours on Perfect. this. We're, we're in lockstep with you. This is going to be big. This is going to be significant. That, in, in fact, a couple weeks ago, when I had this conversation, uh, with the, the designated developer, the, there were other, other developers from the Morrissey Boulevard sort of corridor present. And most of the conversation was, was focused on the, the public realm and transportation yeah. because everybody's got skin in that game. Uh, uh, Nordblom Development, which has yeah. the Boston Globe site, uh, the, the uh, Corcoran Development, which has been there for, for, for decades. Everybody wants to get this right. Everybody can benefit and everybody can okay. get hurt if this isn't, you Most know, of the well planned. Live there, they got, will get hurt though if we don't do it right. I'm sorry? Most of the people that live there will be hurt exactly. if we don't get it no, right. We're, we're, we're very sensitive to that. Good. We're, we're going to get this right. I appreciate that. We, we, we need to make sure that that is happening while the globe is, is being planned. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and it's outside of my district, but, I, but I've been following it a little bit, <clears throat> and I'm pretty excited about it, the skate project over in Fenway. Is that something that we like? Is that like a, because I think when we're dealing with, um, you know, affordable housing and different ways of housing, <clears throat> like I think we need to start re-examining what we're building, building different things, because yeah. the two bedroom, two bath, isn't, isn't gonna get, get us out of it. We're gonna need to do the small units, the communal living, all kinds of different styles of living. So uh, if, if you can speak about it a little bit, what, what our 30,000 yeah. foot thoughts are on it. Yep, I would just say, you know, from a perspective of 
Wow, that's an interesting product that they're. Um, is it a hotel? No, it's, a, like it's a, a dormitory that wouldn't be necessarily attached to a school. Yeah. They have them in um, other countries. I actually lived in one, fun fact, when I was studying abroad <laughs> in London. In um, London, is London yes. where they are mostly? Uh, there's a bunch of them there, and it's their. The was it fun? Um, it was a little weird. <laughs> it was weird. It was weird because everybody was from different schools. So. Yeah. So, so do they do they do a do they do a master lease with that? Uh, so that, but backing up though, I'm saying is that I think the product is interesting. Um, it would address some of our needs from a city perspective. Where that goes and what it looks like and how it works, that's way too premature. Okay, yeah. so so even though they the, the company that's looking to do this yeah, I mean, has, has bought a place, have, mm -hmm. are they like in the planning process now? And so they've have they filed? I think they're before us. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're before filed, us with an Article 80 proposal. They they haven't been approved. The right. process is still underway. Uh, again, as, as Lauren pointed out, the the concept is 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 appealing. Uh, to a certain extent, it helps with this notion of pulling uh, uh, students out of existing housing it's stock in, fact, in neighborhoods. It's having just students in there. Oh, yeah. how, how does it not right. just become transitional housing or, you know, like... Well, it, if it's all students, nobody else wants to live there. <laughs> it, it also might, depending you know, on how it's regulated... It's very specific. It might be it's permitted as a dorm. Yeah, Communal dormitory. spaces that are different from the other products we're seeing where, yes, it's co-living, but it's of a higher finish. It's not, it's just a, it's a different thing. Yeah, it's not sleeping on bunk beds, it's kind of Sh high end. Sure, an open bay, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 uh, my understanding is this is a, a, uh, uh, a very comfortable product that they're proposing. Yeah, so it's not really a, a this, four or a four. This is near housing, not bare bones living. More um, just student housing to relieve some pressure, I'll, I'll yield. Correct, but, it's a, but a for-profit <laughs> that could pull uh, students out of neighborhoods, that's appealing. Mm -hmm. But whether this particular project that you're referencing, this size, this location, the nature of the product, the way it operates, whether that ends up passing muster at Article 80, we just don't know, it's right. too early. Interest, I just think it's an interesting project and, you know. Mm -hmm. Is, would it be similar to the one, I don't know if they filed yet, 500 Lincoln Street, it's kind of a co-living situation. You familiar with that? 500 Lincoln in yeah. Brighton? Yes. No. I, they've been, they've been um, at, you know, engaging the community. I don't know if they filed yet. I don't think so, no. No. I mean, but we do have, you know, we have a compact housing program, which is, again, it's different. So there's, there's different tiers of um, different products, housing products, and, you know, some of them are great in certain areas, and some of them are completely inappropriate for others. And, and I would just add that in the mayor's housing plan, there's a whole chapter on student housing. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about in previous sessions about how to how to accomplish exactly this, how to move students out of housing that was built for Boston's workforce, so we, we can return it to Boston's workforce. So, as explicit goal in our housing strategy, the idea of um, working with private developers to build off-campus student-specific housing fully endorsed as, a, as from a policy perspective. Lots of community advocates have written in to say, like, that's exactly a strategy, we love it, but then the, the devil's in the details. Where yeah. exactly is it gonna go? How's it gonna be regulated? Are they gonna have a dormitory license or is these apartments? Right. These yeah. apartments, how are they access to everyone? So there's a lot of really so, great so questions So policy, here. policy, you're kind of there, but we're, we're still gonna take yeah, it. Yeah, how does that policy, it's, it's actually really exciting because now yeah. we have an opportunity to apply the policy to a real world example and say, okay, what what really works, what doesn't work, and let's, 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 let's vet this further. But in terms of recruiting this type of project, I think we've been really eager to see that in Boston. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Council Sealman. Um, I have a question for Trin. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I know if we I know when the City of Boston or the BPDA is recruiting a company to come to the city, do we also try to encourage them to provide um, more outreach to the neighborhood in terms of job training? Um, are we training our young people on jobs that they could get in these great companies that are moving to the Boston, South Boston waterfront, or um, how, does, how does that conversation go? So um, I actually would defer that question to the Office of Economic Development and also um, the Boston uh, Resident Jobs Policy 
folks, and I'm, you know, those are very good questions. I'd love to um, take a deeper dive and get some concrete answers for you. But I think in short of it, um, we are very interested in linking um, employers that come to the city of Boston who not only really recruits from higher end talent pools, which mm -hmm. is those who have a bachelor's degree, which is about 48% in Boston. Um, and so what we wanna do is make sure that when we're recruiting employers, we wanna make sure that we're selling Boston as a whole and ensure that all of Boston can meet the supply chain of employers from entry level all the way into middle management all the way to senior. Um, you know, we have the luxury of having a very uh, competitive talent pool, as you know, with those who have graduate degrees and those who have post-secondary education completion and BAs, but uh, 54 to 58% of Bostonians don't have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we are working with the Office of Edu um, Economic Development um, and also their uh, Director of B Business Strategy to put together employment uh, agreements that are enforceable and or are within the legal parameters to work to ensure that those jobs are accessible for everybody, not just the selected few who have um, a BA. Um, so that's the overall mm -hmm. arching vision that we have uh, in terms of actual tools and results. I would defer to a couple of the departments I mentioned earlier. No, thank, thank you. I, it, it is a very important question. It's a, it's a question that comes up a, a lot. No, thank you. I, I shared the South Boston District with Councilor Baker and Mary Ellen McCormick and uh, West Broadway Development and Old Colony and I also have Cathedral, a lot of these public housing developments. Um, are we doing um, any public, are we doing any recruitment or job training specifically in, in BHA, um, trying to target BHA residents? Um, yes, actually, we have um, long-term commitments with uh, Boston Housing Authority, particularly in um, specifically for uh, English language learners mm -hmm. um, and ESL two and three, so that they can move into a career pathway once they get uh, proficient in an English um, stature. Um, and then we also work with the BHA to recruit for our tuition-free community college plan to ensure that every every young person in there knows that they have access to affordability in terms of um, uh, post-secondary education. Um, and we work directly with uh, BHA staff to um, recruit and do job fairs direct, uh, at their property sites. Um, so that's, that's really important. Um, I, I think what is really dire is to, to ensure that every Boston residents have opportunities in not just a job, but a career pathway that mm -hmm. allows them to obtain some credentials so that they can move up the career ladder. So we've transitioned from a rapid job placement model into a more career pathway, so investing in long term uh, for um, all Boston residents. So yes, we do um, work directly with the properties and the sites of BHA. No, thank you for your great work. Oh, you're welcome. Frank Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Trin, the, uh, so how long has the City Academy been, been running? Uh, a year and a half. A year and a half, okay. And, and how, many, how many people in that year and a half have gone out the back door? And, and, and how many have gotten jobs? So we um, did 50 info sessions around the city and 500 Boston residents had applied for these slots. Um, 12 uh, have graduated from commercial driver's license and hoisting, and about probably 85% of them already got jobs. Uh, unfortunately, in the private sector, because they just pay more and the demand is bigger, uh, were, there, were there city jobs available to them? There, there were some city jobs available, but I, I think what is tough about job uh, training is is the job placements. The timing has to be right. Right. And so we t we try to time it with HR directors' vacancies. Um, but at the end of the day, um, they, uh, the graduates do get jobs in Walgreens and CVS. And then what we do is put them on a list and call them back when those jobs are available. With the EMTs, they go straight into Chief Hooley's department and they have 15 slots. Um, so we have uh, those first cohort, and we have the second one coming up this fall. For EMS or the or the or the uh, the drivers. For both. Oh, good. Come the second. 
this uh, fall. Coming out this fall or going in this fall? Uh, we have a second <coughs> session um, this fall, so another 24 um, slots, training slots for each of those tracks, um, and we're still monitoring the placements of the first cohort, which is 2024. So we have 50 altogether at yeah. the end of the year. 50 in, in, in a year and a half. Correct. Good, good. Um, is there, do we have any place in Boston that the city doesn't necessarily control, but we work with outside of the, and I would call it not necessarily a low bar, but a place to go in um, we don't have to be referred like so I know Ben Frank we work with Ben Franklin a lot and and the um, Bunker Hill is there any place other than that that is maybe a little less formal for, for, for job training um, well we we fund about a hundred job uh, training programs 65 um, have actual space in job mm -hmm. training they you know Goodwill Memorial has a very big space that we use Jewish vocational services operation able um, Asian American Civic Association. I mean, I can go down the list, and um, there they have more rental nonprofit spaces that yep. that we use, and um, some vary from um, less informal to more formal, depending on the industry that they're studying. Um, but I think one of the things that we do want to do is have more job trainings in state or city funded spaces, yeah. mainly because um, they can matriculate into post-secondary education because they're already there. And it's a one-stop shop, so they don't have to go from one place to another. Um, but it's also a good thing to use city spaces for things like, you know, job training and placement and, um, you know, community college satellite offices, mainly because... Um, it's a city program, and um, we're serving city residents. Um, so we have been talking with uh, Director Golden and his staff about how do we, when we're doing planning and um, looking at community benefits, how do we, um, you know, integrate some of these nonprofit spaces into the commercial spaces so that residents can actually um, access it. Thank you. So um, is there... With the job training money, is there any appetite to build new, like to, to build actual spaces that we could um, maybe direct people to that, that, that may be something new from the ground up? Like is, and I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the globe. The globe is 3,000 jobs, high tech jobs in the next year or so. And, and so, in dealing with them, they've agreed to give the community a space that would be dedicated to job training. The issue, like, is there an appetite to take job training money to build out, so they're gonna deliver, deliver a space. Is there any appetite to, to, for job training money to help build out that space, what it may look like for, for job training for those jobs that, are in, that will be in the globe? Um, you know, I don't want to say no, uh, especially if you're the new um, trustee that we're working with, and I am, you know, answering to the Should chair, I ask Mark? The, the, the chair of the previous Neighborhoods Jobs Trust, so I want to be careful with my answer. Um, you, you know, I, I do want to stress that the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust is very, has specific language on using the investment dollars towards, um, towards job training. And um, depending on the application, the proposal, and the RFP process, um, we'd love to think innovatively of how to leverage those training dollars with capital investments, such as the one that you just talked about, which is, you know, you have a developer with commercial space who's willing to use X amount of square footage towards job training, educational services for its residents, and would prefer that, that link, those linkage dollars then rerouted back mm. to that, um, that center? Yes, uh, I mean, that's something that we'd love to think about in terms of leveraging dollars. We did that with the BHA Tyranny Center with Old Colony, using the Tyranny Center as a job training, and we fund that. So, so, so the the there is a precedent. Was, was built by the developer there, and then and then they got job training money. Correct. Okay. I mean, they didn't get a lot of it, but we, yeah, we but did, they did get an infused investment that leveraged other dollars. But the key is that the tyranny center and the developer put up those capital dollars 
um, so that that space can be used for the community and particularly job training. Yeah, and the reason why I ask, because as the future unfolds, I have um, Glover's Corner, which the developer that, that looks like will have a start in there already owns 20 acres in there. Talk to, talk to them extensively about job training, how there should be brick and mortar job training right within Glover's Corner to train for those jobs that will happen. Glover's Corner is 70 acres or whatever, and, and, and I hope it's mostly jobs. So I'd like to be able to come up with a, a, a formula to be able to help you know, that, that person is going to deliver that public um, benefit to, to maybe benefit a little bit from the, the job training money. So if we can, we can work out that stuff in, in the future. And also, Mary Ellen McCormick, same thing. I'm talking with Wynn about brick and mortar within that, within that project that they're training for, the maintenance jobs in the buildings and, and whatever else. I mean, if, if, if we're talking about 75 acres of building on, on Glover's Corner, there's got to be 500 jobs in there that, that, that we could be, be training people towards. So that's some of the stuff that we'll be talking about in the next year or so, Trin. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, that is absolutely the vision that you, you hear with my colleagues from, you know, Director Golden to Devin and to Lauren, is we're, we're trying to, to weave some of these critical pieces together when we're looking at development and building, mm -hmm. is that we need to link jobs with wealth creation, with community input, with diversity and inclusion, and ensure that the economic development that's happened across the city doesn't just stay in one neighborhood or a top tier of a certain class, that that is redistributed around the neighborhoods. So you see some of these pockets in these models, and my colleagues have been talking about it. Um, so we are subscribing to that vision, and we're working hard to build the tools and the maps to do that, but it, it's, it's a work in progress. Let me, let me just um, add that, you know, I worked with Trin for the past five and a half years um, <laughs> as a trustee. And prior to that, I was five years with the previous administration. And I think Trin has brought a focus and an energy and a direction to that office that really truly links our folks with jobs and, more importantly, career paths. Yeah. And I think we also <clears throat> need to remain nimble because our economy is changing, it evolves. We, we, I don't know if we want to invest in a brick and mortar place that we have to hold on to, yeah. and then something happens to that industry. A developer is gonna, is gonna <coughs> invest in a brick and mortar. <clears throat> right, well, well that, that's yeah. great. Um, but I still think we still need, need to remain nimble. And I, I just want to update folks, that I just got a tweet out that the, the Senate has, uh, it, try to, at least they're attempting to increase the CPA match for more affordable housing. So, good. so we sure. continue to work on that issue. Uh, let me recognize uh, Councillor Flynn. Yeah, thank you again, Councillor. Um, and thank you, Trent, for your great input on these questions. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Baker um, on the job training aspect for Mary Ellen McCormick and Ando Colony. We, we represent the, both of the areas. Um, is there anything that the city council can do to be helpful uh, to you on, on those two uh, developments? I know there's a huge need for job training in, in our public housing, but um, you know certainly myself and Council Baker would be supportive of whatever we could do to be helpful to you on that issue. Well, um, you know, thank you so much for the support. I will think about ways in which we can work closely. Um, we do work closely with Boston Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. They have a significant amount of what they call the Neighborhoods Choice um, Grants from HUD, which then uh, we leverage with our linkage dollars so that they can provide educational opportunities and uh, job training in growth industries for um, those two developments. Um, but I would assume that um, they would need support in getting additional funding from HUD and the feds to really leverage the city dollars because clearly it's, it's not enough. Um, but I will definitely circle, take you on it and circle back with you to give you more concrete ways in which um, you can support us. Excellent. And thank you. Excellent, and thank you. Um, my, fi my final question, if I may. Um, can you talk about, just from your experience, um, any difficulties you're seeing as it relates to um, uh, Corey issues, 
for job training, for getting into a job placement, yep. and in any maybe any recommendations on what we could do to um, give people a second or a third chance, especially getting into a job training program. So I, again, I would defer to the Office of Public Safety. Uh, Kevin Sibley um, and, uh, runs that office with the mayor's office, um, and they work directly with reentry. We do have a youth options unlimited job training program in Roxbury, mm -hmm. um, and you know, Corey is uh, has different levels. Um, I mean, there's different offenses, different crimes, and different times. So I don't want to take the time to go through those segments. Um, but we definitely want to ensure that um, re residents um, deserve second, third, or fourth chances, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily deserve just minimum wage jobs. And even if they do, as an entry level, we want to make sure we take them after six months and then put them into more of a career pathway. So we're real we're aligning systems and the ecosystems to make them work better. Um, and so that's a population that's definitely a priority uh, of the administration and of our office. Thank you, and I, I, maybe my final, my final point is what type of, um, I know I focused a lot on South Boston issues, but what are, um, what are some of the outreach efforts you're doing um, for the Asian community, specifically in Chinatown or the Vietnamese community in Dorchester? Um, are we providing any good job training programs for them? Yep. So um, actually in Chinatown, we, we work very closely invest in Boston Chinatown Neighborhood mm -hmm. Association and also the Chinatown Progressive Association. Um, and we uh, obviously fund and support the Asian American Civic Association with the Ben Franklin Institute and focusing on auto mechanic um, career pathway. And we're really focusing on English level two and three, which the state does not focus on and fund. And so our dollars, because they're a little more flexible, fund those who have English level threes into career pathways, um, you know, either in hospitality that pays more, like local 26, uh, or best core, and or um, the industry and healthcare, which tends to be um, you know, um, more attractive to the Asian American population. Um, and then, you know, in terms of Dorchester, the Vietnamese community, we work with the Viet Aid, the Vietnamese mm -hmm. American Initiative for Development, which is a CDC in Fields Corner. Um, while they focus more on affordable housing, um, we do uh, try to work with them on job training as um, the Vietnamese first generation immigrants or um, you know, the elders and the seniors are, uh, are uh, learning more about English. Um, and then they fold into um, the organizations that I talked about earlier. Uh, we are finding that a lot of Quincy residents um, who are Chinese speaking are um, accessing more Dorchester resources just because it's closer and because it's more competitive. Um, uh, but we we want to make sure that um, we're um, prioritizing Boston residents. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Council Baker. Um, <clears throat> and just a, one or two more questions. Are we seeing any any prefab construction happening? I know that there is a modular housing development in Sullivan Square that's underway. That, that's like a the, whole development. Yeah. How many buildings did, was it? Was uh, it Article it's 80 with you guys? Article. I, I don't wasn't here for the Article 80 process. I don't can't speak to that in detail. I imagine it was. I think it's about 150 units. But as, as a general trend, I don't think there's a whole lot of prefab. Yeah, 150 units. Um, and, and what are the structure? The, are they smaller structures, one or two families, or are they, yeah, they building the rental apartments? Right. The oh. graphic is the name of the development. So not not. Tall yeah. buildings, yeah, five story. Okay, and, and it's and it's prefab. Uh, it, it is. Modular. It's modular, right? Mm -hmm. So it was fab, part, pieces were fabricated, analyzed, and then panelized, brought into you know, space. Boxes. Yeah. Okay, it, it it is interesting. It comes up every once in a while, counselor, but it doesn't seem to be pervasive. Yeah, it doesn't take. Uh, off. We've definitely heard of multiples, but not a lot. Yeah. Uh, there, there was one, in fact, I think uh, one of the charter schools uh, in the one in East Boston. I think may have been a modular uh, structure. I think there was a. I think there was a modular in Alston, one yeah, of the ones over by the pike. Streets, uh, yeah, by the brain tree. Yeah. yeah, but again, they're, they're all one-offs. Yeah, the, the it's not pervasive. Given the pace, 
given the, the, the numbers out there, they seem to be a rather I think insignificant. People, people are still not quite comfortable with it yet, I think. You know, I, I'm not sure that people are crazy about the construction style. They think they're getting less of a product. I don't, I don't really know. I've walked through some prefabs and you know, I think it's all in We don't pick it up on it a lot because it, it, by the time Article 80 is done, then you're dealing with how you're going to build this thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's more a question over at ISD, not, not for us. So they're going to go through Article 80 and, and not know if it's going to be prefab yet? I think in theory they could. Yeah, they, they I it, we could I know. Want, I would want to know that up front. Yeah, I don't. Um, I, I, for, from a standpoint, uh, look, uh, our, our Article 80 jurisdiction looks at, you know, height, density, yeah. use, impacts, mm -hmm. whether this is a bona fide traditional stick built, you know, four story yeah, structure you it. or a modular, it, it doesn't come up. It does, our, our regulatory oversight doesn't go to that little level of detail mm -hmm. for the development, how they actually build this. Uh, obviously, it has to be something that's built according to code, mm -hmm. but that's all going to be an ISD yeah. concern, not ours. Yeah, okay, and I promise this is my last question. <laughs> uh, employment service contractors, there's a whole list of them from 91,000 down to like 500. What are, those, what are those people doing? So those are, they're, they're in a variety, I, sh I have that list here somewhere as well. lawyers or? So there's different things. Uh, there are, for instance, if we had a discrete need for somebody to work on a project for uh, two years, don't necessarily want a bona fide full-time permanent employee, but we might do a two-year contract. That's what you're looking at. There is actually an individual here. I cite that because we have a specific project, Smart Utilities, very forward way, less disruptive, more efficient, more resilient way of doing utilities uh, associated with large projects. Instead of piecemeal break in the ground every time we create corridors, we're looking at better, more innovative ways to do utilities. We have someone working that for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's not, we, we did not seek uh, full-time forever. We have a series, these are OWD folks, they work in the Office of Financial Empowerment and Boston Tax <laughs> Health, things like that, more seasonal. Uh, as you may know, we, we prepare thousands and thousands of tax returns for primarily low-income Bostonians every year. So the tax season is finite and discrete. We have a lot of people working on short-term contracts for those types of things. So these positions, are uh, to, to help us avoid uh, taking on permanent obligations yeah. when we don't need them. So that, the, and we could go through each one of them, but that, that's the flavor of, of who's here. Thank so you. I, I just want to clarify too that um, a lot of the, the persons you see on the employment service contracts are actually grant funded as well as, so Director Golden is talking about more seasonal and short term, based on when the grants end and when they start. Um, and we have been very conscious about uh, trying our best to get a large percentage of them Boston resident mm -hmm. contractors. N it's not 100%, but we are trying that effort. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a really important qualification. Mm -hmm. The money that funds these positions isn't necessarily coming from our traditional operating cash. It's coming from grants. And when that's finite, we don't, we don't want to incur that obligation in perpetuity if the money goes away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Great. Chair. The, the one other thing I'd like to point out, Councillor, just uh, for a point of clarification, the, it, we, when we talked about the private dorm scape, oh, uh, yeah. the, the, I, I think it may have been lost in the shuffle. There, the, there is an instance of one private dorm that I know of in the city. It's, it sits on northeastern land. It's very much a northeastern dorm. It sits on northeastern land, but it was privately constructed, privately owned, privately operated, but it looks and feels very much like a northeastern dorm. That's how northeastern wanted it for a variety of reasons, and we may see this happen again and again. Well, then northeastern doesn't have to build it. It doesn't come off their it, books. Exactly. They don't want the liability on their books. So we so, also have the peninsula in, in, um, in Columbia Point there. Or oh, right. So the, a similar. I guess it's not Columbia Point anymore. It's Harbor Point. The di the, what makes Scape a little different is private land, private owner, private developer, private operator. 
not affiliated with a university. So you could have lots of different universities, populations in there. Do, in this, I know I had one question a couple questions ago, <laughs> but um, so do we connect them on with um, um, college presidents to talk about master leases with with grad students, or I mean, how do we how do we ensure as the city that someone's coming in? I'm going to build this for um, students, but unless we know there's a master lease in place, there it, it it doesn't necessarily need to be students. Or how, how do we if if they're saying the use is going to be a student use, how do we would that be? Well, the well, for instance, it was it was lice, the the northeastern one was licensed as a dorm. As a dorm, so whatever it looks like, it may look like this new this, but we're going to just call it a dorm to to keep it easy on zoning and. Right, you could, but but to your point, you could be in a situation where someone's saying, "Hey, I want to essentially operate this and build this as a dorm." but I don't want to be licensed as a dorm. My operating you know, model is these should all be students, but if it's not licensed as a dorm and there's not some other regulatory control, then in theory it could be you know, a bunch of efficiency <coughs> units with non-students and students. To the point that was made earlier, I think, by, by Devin and Lauren, there aren't a lot of people who probably want to live in a building that is primarily operating as a dorm, yeah. even if there is an opportunity to get in there. But in theory, these things do come up. If it's not licensed as a dorm and otherwise regulated as a, as a dorm, you know, through an IMP process, which would re require to be licensed as one, I, I think what, what would be the, the, the nature of that, that animal, that yeah. particular thing? We, don't, we didn't have to run into that with regard to Northeastern because Northeastern wanted this very much as a dorm. They just didn't want it on their books. So it is a dorm. It, it operates as a dorm, but it was privately so built. So does, does Northeastern fill those beds? Yes. Or is it, or yes. Is, yeah, so yes. Northeastern's yes. there as a partnership, so will SCAPE has, have so partnerships? They've begun having preliminary discussions, but they don't have a partnership yet. So stay tuned. It's uh, Just to underscore, it's something we're, we clearly care about and want to make sure that it's appropriate and it works, um, and we need to watch out. Yeah, so the hostel on, on Stewart Street, Mm -hmm. How do we know that this doesn't turn into that? Not that that's a bad... Well, that's a different use, so they would have to change the use. So the use is yeah. a hostel that... Yeah, that is actual hostel okay. use. I believe it even had to go to the ZBA. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Um, Brian, did, did you... Did I misspeak about 500 Lincoln Street? What kind of... So when I just checked with yeah. staff, Mr. Chairman, they said there, there had... There, there has been communication right. from that developer. Yeah. I think we understand they're out there, right. but they haven't they filed haven't anything filed. with us. Yeah. We don't gotcha. have a formal Article 80 right. um, proposal before gotcha. us. Right, but you're aware of it now. Uh, yes, I am aware of it now, and staff yeah. was aware, <laughs> right. aware of it before me. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, no public testimony, nothing further from my colleagues. Let me just say that you know I've been in this position 12 years. Uh, BPDA in particular can be uh, a lightning rod for the city, for elected officials, for our activists in the neighborhood. But I just want to go on record saying from the top down, including you, uh, director, your staff at the highest level, all the way down to your project managers who are on the front lines, who are unsung heroes, I would say. Uh, you have a staff of very committed, thoughtful, and caring individuals that I've gotten to know and enjoyed working with, uh, sometimes not under the greatest of circumstances, but very professional. And uh, you know, I just wanted to put that on the record uh, because you guys get hit a lot as the BPDA, right? But you're all, there's all, it's made up of a lot of individuals who I've gotten to know and, and care a lot about. So I just wanted to say that as I head out. <laughs> uh, thank you so head much for the door. kind words, Mr. Chairman. It has been a great pleasure personally for me to work with you during my almost 10 years in, in, in the building wow. and yeah. five, five plus years in the director's position of the BPDA. Thank you for the, the tremendous courtesy and decency you've always shown the organization and its and its staff. Uh, you, you're, you're a great gentleman. We will miss you uh, uh, when we come back for a visit approximately one year from now on <laughs> right. this particular subject. Yeah. But um, I feel the same way about staff. They really are the best of the best. They do really difficult, 
-hmm. challenging, stressful work, mm -hmm. but it pays dividends for the people of Boston all along the socioeconomic spectrum. I always tell them you're in the business of continuing to create one of the great cities of the world, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. a great privilege and a great burden, right. uh, but we really appreciate your, your, your kind words about uh, all the team at the BPDA. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. On that note, this hearing is adjourned.